Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I am Louise Palenker. Our job is to curate your free time, suggest things to watch, read, and listen to, building up to welcoming interesting guests. And today we're action packed with two visitors. First, Shelley Herman, a show business veteran who has a very entertaining new book about her stint as a page at NBC called My Peacock Tales Secrets of an NBC Page. Great stories about catering to tourists and needy celebrities working at the Peacock Network work during its prime. Also, we have one of the most renowned fingerstyle acoustic guitarists in the world, Lawrence Juber. He was lead guitarist for Paul McCartney and Wings for three years. He had a spectacular, has a spectacular solo career, and he's here to talk about his newest album called A Day in the Life. A Day in My Life. A Day in My Life. God bless him. He was the band leader on my television show for two years. It's Fritz. Amazing memories. We'll get into some of them. Can't wait to talk to Lawrence. But first... Oh, I love this part. Oh, you're going to brag. Shameless self-promotion. Yes. As you know, Wheezy, yeah. you and I are a couple of woke boomers who are fascinated by topics like politics and history as much as we are about classic pop culture. And we feel so fortunate that we get to discuss these subjects every week with fantastic guests. So it makes us infinitely happy when you love watching or listening to the show as much as we love creating it. Our YouTube channel is blowing up. Great growth lately. Here are a few recent comments on last week's interview with Bob Cowsell and Raised Wrong. Hashtag Mark Wester says, I love this interview with Ray's Wrong. I'm a big fan of the group. And Michael Ritchie 358 says, awesome show. Love learning more about Bob and the Goldbergs. 358 is my favorite, uh, Ritchie. Yeah. Yeah, why do they come up with that number? Because there's, there's a lot of 57 Ritchie. Oh, okay. You have to get in line, yeah. All right. And uh, I also love the popular clip of our interviews with Henry Winkler. And Thomas Tom says, wonderful memories. Hey. And in audio platform news, we recently charted in the books category in Denmark. Denmark. On Apple Podcasts. We're, we're getting charting in places that we've never been to and probably I will never I have been go. to Denmark. Oh, have you? I've How been is... to Copenhagen. Oh, good. Well, it's lovely. Thank you so much, as always, for your support, and please subscribe, like, comment, and continue to enjoy wherever you come along with us on the media path. Weezy, what do you have for us this week? Well, I've been watching TV, Fritz. Uh Uh-oh. So I'm going to be recommending a film. It's part of the American Experience Experience. It's called The Harvest, Integrating Mississippi's Schools by Pulitzer Prize-winning author Douglas A. Blackman. After the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court ruling in 1954, it took an executive order by Eisenhower and nine courageous students under escort from the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division to integrate Little Rock High School in Arkansas. Those dramatic historical events and images eclipsed the reality that most schools and neighborhoods throughout the South remained segregated for more than another decade. In 1969, Doug Blackman was about to enter first grade when a Mississippi high court ordered that their schools be fully and immediately integrated. Doug looks back on his experiences and those of his classmates, teachers, and parents through the lens of this film. Set against vast historic and demographic changes unfolding across the nation, The Harvest follows a coalition of black and white citizens working to comply with the court order in the most rigidly segregated swath of America, a cotton town in the middle of the Mississippi Delta. The film shares how parents and teachers across both sides of the tracks pulled together to integrate their schools, and then it traces the lives of those most involved and affected. From the first day of first grade on through high school graduation in 1982 and into their own personal perspectives today. The impact of court order change rebounded into the formation of private Christian segregation academies and public schools that quickly lost most of their white students. Not Doug. His parents were determined to learn and grow and evolve their own awareness of people with different backgrounds. His mom tells us that before Doug had a black teacher, she had never had a conversation with a black person where they sat as equals. As a white child of the South, her understanding was expanding and she was open to it. But racism is stubborn. It's not enough to integrate schools when towns and parents and restaurants and bathrooms and movie theaters remain segregated. Doug's childhood was rich with new friends, but poor in their ability to socialize outside of school. In a South that remained entrenched in its institutions of prejudice, black and white students were school friends only and could not even visit each other's homes. 
The harvest is a critical portrait of how painfully and awkwardly the South and most of our nation has stumbled towards the promise of our American ideal and of how in that effort, many children and parents who were willing to do the hard work learned from one another that they could do better and be better. It's also a hard look at how much further we all need to travel to reach our potential. The Harvest is an American experience film by Douglas A. Blackman, and you will find it on PBS. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's right up here. Well, I'm going to talk about a show on FX and then the following day, Hulu. It's Feud, Capote versus the Swans. This is a multi-part series based on a best-selling book, Capote's Women, a true story of love, betrayal, and a swan song for an era. Truman Capote is one of the world's most famous writers in the 60s and 70s. He wrote a seminal book in the new genre known as journalistic fiction called In Cold Blood, which was a true story made into a successful movie starring Robert Blake. He also wrote the novella, which turned into Breakfast at Tiffany's with Audrey Hepburn. Capote was a social climber and affixed himself to some of the richest and most powerful ladies on the Upper West Side of New York. Women like Babe Paley, who was married to William Paley, the chairman of CBS. Lee Radziwill, who was Jackie Kennedy's sister. C.Z. Guest, married to a world-famous polo player, but an accomplished actor, author, and columnist on her own. Joanne Carson, Johnny Carson's first wife, and many others. Capote became a confidant, a confessor, and intimate friend of this group of women, but he ended up betraying them by writing a thinly veiled fictional account of the group, including many of their dark, intimate secrets for Esquire magazine. They turned their backs on him at this point, and this caused him to go into a downward uh, downward spiral from which he never recovered. The show isn't just about high society dish. First of all, it's a star-studded cast. Naomi Watts is Bay Paley. Diane Lane is Slim Keith, who was an American socialite and fashion icon. Chloe Sevigny as CZ Guest. Clarissa Flockhart as Lee Radziwell. Demi Moore as Anne Woodward, who was a socialite model and radio actress. And Molly Ringwald as Joanne Carson. The writing and acting are superb. Truman Capote is played by Tom Hollander. Most recently, Hollander was in season two of White Lotus. He was in Bohemian Rhapsody and dozens of BBC productions. Truman Capote was a very flamboyant and very fey character. It would be very easy to make a cartoon out of him, but Hollander is excellent and walking the line to keep him real and vulnerable. The latest episode, episode five, includes James Baldwin, who was another gay literary figure of the times, and he swoops in to pull his close friend Truman Capote out of his malaise. This episode, we're proud to say, was directed by Max Winkler, son of our good friend Henry Winkler, and it's a very touching episode. The first feud series was done about Betty Davis and Joan Crawford and their ongoing feud, and it became a sensation. This is a fun watch, but it's surprisingly well written and well shot. Wow. So Max is cooking, huh? Oh, Isn't Max, that amazing? I love that. All right, here we go. Yes. Has our first guest left yet? Oh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. She's very patient. Right, you have to be patient when you're an NBC page. That, <laughs> that's right. Here's Shelly Herman. She's written a very entertaining book called My Peacock Tales, Secrets of an NBC Page. It's especially entertaining to those of us who were housed in the same NBC facility, 3000 West Alameda, Burbank, California, for many years. Her stories are about wrangling tourists and audience members and navigating stars whose egos were often bigger than their talent. It's really a fun read. Shelley, we're happy to have you. I'm so thrilled to be here, and I'm so glad you said something about Feud, too, because this is one of Treat Williams' last appearances. I I, I should have mentioned that. Absolutely. I thought, wow, that must have been like a few weeks before he died. Yeah, I I heard Naomi Watts, on. it might have been Stephen Colbert's show, saying she can't even watch it right now, because it's it's still so close to her. He plays Bill Paley, who was the chairman of CBS. And a real cad. Yeah, yeah. Wow. All those people were. They they, they were like amoral. Money ruins your morals, you know? That's the reason I'm I'm looking forward to that. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Here we go. Goals, hashtag. (laughs) Well, you know, they had an NBC page program at, at in Burbank, even earlier in at 30 Rock, but in Burbank since 1936. What years were you there? You weren't there in 1936, were you? I, and I look fabulous. No, I started June 21st, 1976, the longest day. And uh, 
just last year they celebrated their 90th anniversary of the page program wow so uh we've been and they still for a while. have reunions I, I went and spoke at one of the page reunions one time it was so fun up at universal were you at that no one? no this was uh this was at a, at a, you know, what used to be chadney's now it's something else right across the street and it's probably something else by the time we finish speaking about probably, this <laughs> probably so uh, this had to be fun for you because you grew up in southern california and this was a this was a goal of yours to become an nbc page even before you were old enough to do it well i was lucky enough while i was in high school at agora high school to do a field trip to go see the midnight special being taped which was a late night rock concert show and i i purposefully did this where i wore like a big white hat and we were all sitting on the floor on pillows like we were a bunch of hippie chicks you were a swan I, I was trying to be. I was yeah. trying to be. Yeah. And I just recently went on YouTube and found the episode, and I could I can see my big white hat. You found the person who couldn't see the show. Exactly. Who was sitting Going, right with behind With their you. fist in the air. Yeah, like, why? So I saw these people wearing these ugly polyester outfits, standing around, listening to rock and roll music, and they were getting paid to do it. And up until that time, the only other job I ever had was working as an usher at the Valley Music Theater. It was a domed building in Woodland Hills. And uh, I was escort- I got to escort Jack Benny, George Burns, to see people like Woody Allen and Jim Croce. And I thought, well, I volunteered. I know I can get a job at NBC as a page. I can ush. Yeah, but little did I know it's like one of the most coveted entry-level jobs in the entertainment industry. And, and I, I, want, I don't remember them all. Let me see. Uh, the people who started as pages, Chuck Barris, Regis Philbin, Gene Rayburn, Peter Marshall, and Aubrey Plaza, one of my favorite new actors. Yes. What year? She must have been there the years where I, w- I was there. Well, but she was back in uh, New York. Oh, she was in New York. Never yeah, but mind. another person who um, you might have met in the hallways at the time was Peter Marshall. Yeah. The host of Hollywood Squares. He's 99 years old right And now. doing better than all of us in this room yeah, put together. Yeah, he, he's, he's a lovely man. Oh, he's so, we just recently interviewed him for the National Archive of Game Show History. Where I'm, I'm involved with a museum to... Uh, to catalog all of the game shows, oh. all of the uh, memorabilia. There's there's a lot of wives that are very happy because they're going to get their garages back because their husbands oh. have, been, <laughs> have been stealing things for years. Mm. To, what to a get blessing! In the museum. So what are the requirements to be a page? You have to have a college degree, right? Yeah. At the time, I kind of snuck in under the wire. I was still a student at Cal State Northridge, and they had just ended a, a strike, and they quick needed a bunch of people to uh, give the tours of the building. So I, I just got in under the wire. Uh, what they ask you now, and, it, and and anybody who's listening to this, you don't have to be in New York or L.A. to be a page at NBC. They've opened it up so well. Uh, you have to have your college degree. You send in a two-minute videotape saying why you think you'd be a good little page. And then if they like you, they really, really like you, they'll fly you on their dime to either Universal Studios, where they have the NBC offices now, or to 30 Rock. They'll put you up in a hotel, and they'll get to meet you. And uh, if you have 18 months of your life that you want to devote to NBC, this is where you should be. So I'm going to tell you our par- a little bit about our parallel page yes. stories, because we have to go to coffee and then discuss the rest of it. Okay, so... When I was a kid, I would watch the the page give the card to Johnny Carson on Stump the Band, and I thought, that's how I'll get into show business, because I don't have any discernible talent. So I can hand cards. And so when I got to L.A., I tried out for all the different page jobs around town, and at NBC, they put me on the wait list, because you can only be a page for 18 months, and so they they age out, or they time out. And she said, no, you're in. It's just a matter of when we get to you. In the meantime, I got a job at Metro Media Square as a page. Now, this was Metro Tape. It was It's the Fox building that had an erector set on the roof at the mm-hmm. corner of Sunset and, I don't, you know, Sunset and something. Will Across Co- from KTLA. Will Cox or somebody. Yeah. yeah. So I'm working there for six months. I got myself an internship on the John Davidson talk show. So I was already, like, all set, doing well working my way, having a great time. I had a polyester uniform with a name tag. I asked Mr. Blackburn what he thought of my uniform, and he said, not much, (laughs) which is, you know, the correct answer. And the phone rings. It's for me. I go to the research room. No one had a cell phone. The phone is on the wall, and and the the lady says, and it's probably the woman that you talk about throughout your book. What was her name? Eba Hawkins. Probably Eba saying, okay, we're ready to hire you. And in, in two seconds, I had to decide my future because I'm at a crossroads. If I say yes, I go this way and my life is this way. And if I say no, I'm going to stay where I am. And we've all had those moments. And it happens oh, yeah. in your early 20s where 
you know, do I move to New York with this girl or do I stay here? And you've had these moments, Lawrence, I'm sure. Where do I stay with this band or I, do I go over here? And everyone you meet is going to be different. Everything you encounter is going to be different. And I, I just made the decision to stay where I was. We had the Norman Lear sitcoms. We had the John Davidson talk show, which is no Johnny Carson, but I was getting to meet all the same people you were meeting, except Fred Astaire. I was really jealous of the page that met Fred Astaire. So we had very, very parallel. Mine were the early 80s. Yours was the 70s. But the job, the life of a page is so interesting because you have to be really good on your feet, but then you also have to know when to shut up. Yeah, listening is a good skill to develop. Because there's a lot of moods. And you have to be able to walk and talk backwards if you're giving a tour. <laughs> That's that's what that's the first thing I tell people is as a job requirement. Walk backwards in closed toe shoes. Uh, that's the that's the main requirement. Um, no, what what I found interesting, parallel wise too, is um, that did, did they have at, at Metro Media? Was it was it a page program or was it more just audience relations? Sort it was of thing? audience relations. We worked with audiences unlimited. And in reading your book, I recognized Donna. You, your yeah, Donna. <laughs> I recognized. What you were doing was was part of branding. You guys represented the franchise. We were just there to work as pages. And yeah, Metro we, Media- we were ambassadors. Yes, exactly. To, to NBC. And and it was it was incumbent upon us to get a job within that 18 months within NBC. Um, I, I, there's a story I, I tell in the book about um, I had tried desperately to get an interview with Dick Ebersol, who at the time was... You were scrappy. Yeah, you were a scrappy little page. Thank you. Um, he was he was the youngest VP at the time. He and Lauren Michael started Saturday Night Live, and his secretary would not give me the time of day. So I'm driving home one night, pouring rain, and I'm on the 101 freeway, and I hear on KBC Talk Radio, and our next guest is Dick Ebersol. And I pulled off the freeway at the Woodlake exit, and I went into the Shell station, and I started putting quarters in the payphone. And uh, the call screener says, what do you want to speak to Dick Ebersol about? And I said, you My know. My future. I said, I want to find out what Guild is really like, you know, something really <laughs> innocuous. And uh, the call screener put me through. And they said, okay, caller, what's your question for Dick Ebersol? And I went, hi, my name is Shelley Herman, and I'm a page at NBC. And I've been trying to get an appointment with you for weeks now, but your secretary won't let me see you. So will you promise me right here and now that you'll make an appointment to see me as soon as we get off the air? And he went, yes. Wow. So what a great story. that's the kind of spunk that you needed but as a page. Did he do it? Did he give you yeah. a... Yeah. Wow. Went and got an appointment, saw him, and the first thing he said as his bit of career advice was leave NBC. And I said, I just got here. And he said, they'll value you more if you bring outside experience to NBC and come back. But I wasn't ready to leave yet. You weren't. That's what happened uh, with our with our intern program at NBC. People come in as an intern from USC or UCLA, and they say, "Well, I, I'd like to work in the weather department now." And I say, "You have to move out to move up because mm-hmm. they'll always perceive you as being somebody at the position they hired you at, and they'll never see you above that. So you got to go somewhere else." Yeah, you're absolutely not, not right. A bad piece of advice. So you you were part of the branding of NBC, and you were smartly dressed, looking like. Uh, a cross between a Catholic school uniform and a flight attendant. Those I love the I love those blue jackets and the things and you were yeah. always smart and the pins and all the. Well, and at the time I was there, they didn't let women wear trousers, oh. so we still were wearing the little the little skirts. Um, but you know, it was it wasn't until the mid seventies that they even let women be a part of the NBC page program. They allowed the women to give the tours, and they were called guidettes. Oh my goodness! Yeah. That's, that's why. Just that's obnoxious. why when you were rattling off the names of all of the people who'd been pages who became famous, because it was a it was a boys' club back in the day, because because the men were being promoted to be executives within NBC, not the women. Yeah. So, um, you know, Aubrey Plaza is one of the few that has got on to make a name for herself. I hope she smiled more when she was giving tours, because her whole <laughs> shtick is having this very s- sullen look on her face, and it makes her hysterical. But as a page, it probably wouldn't serve her well. I imagine she gave some pretty wild tours. Oh, my God. We so did, what we does did, a page we, do? We, did, we gave, well, speaking of where you used to work, mm-hmm. uh, whenever we'd pass um, Studio 5, which was, there was a smaller studio, but then the, the news was done on 5. And we couldn't really go, ever go near there because, you know, there could be a breaking story any minute. But so that everything was always kept ready to go. And we would walk by there and we'd say to the tourists, and over here on stage five, we can't go in there right now. They've filled it with water and they're shooting scenes for Sea Hunt. 
Well, Lawrence and I did a TV show out of the studio. For we're going to talk about that. In a couple of well, minutes. I thought maybe we could touch upon some of your more harrowing experiences because you, you maybe gave the explanation as to why they killed off McLean Stevenson's character on MASH because this was a dangerous man. Well, it's um, it's a long story, but the the abbreviated version is I had befriended McLean before I became a page at NBC mm-hmm. and made it very clear I was not going to go back to his apartment with him, but we were going to be friends. So when he got the job at NBC, I thought, this is my time to try to, you know, see if I can get promoted somehow. And I, I fancied myself to be a writer back then. So I would sit in and watch the rehearsals of the McLean Stevenson show. This was before Hello, Larry. Uh, and I would I would sit there and, and watch what the writers were doing, and I was jotting down notes and thinking, well, you know, if I ever have my chance, I'm going to pitch my story ideas and 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 you know, remember to thank McLean in my Emmy speech. You know, I'm, I've got the whole thing planned. So um, I was in the ticket office, and they said McLean wants to see you. So I had the little paper tucked in my, you know, in my in my blazer, went to his office. We chatted a bit, and then he had one of those little buttons under his desk. No. The Lauer? Yeah. The Matt Lauer switch? The Matt, Mal, Mal, Matt Lauer button. And the door closed. And any other woman, I was still very much a girl back then, but any other woman would have said, open the door and let me out immediately. I started laughing. And he's going, well, why, why are you laughing? And I went, oh, my gosh, it's like something out of the Doris Day show. And you were on the Doris Day show. And, and you're a masher. And you were on MASH. And then he jumped me. Holy cow. And... I got really nervous because I think he like what for my because I'm a child of my mother's breeding. As what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? But I didn't do anything wrong, and I kept thinking I've got to do something to scare him more than I'm scared at this moment. So um, I looked at him and I said, "Listen, we could go through with this, and it would be great because I'm fabulous, but um, I'm going to be late to the Tonight Show." And when they start asking, where was I? I'd have to say, I'm upstairs getting busy with McLean. Or you can get off me right now. We'll pretend like this never happened. And, yeah. and he took a moment, got up, walked over to the door, opened the door, and straightened myself up, walked out, ran down the stairs, went to the Tonight Show studio. And I was, I was shaking. I was just, I didn't know how to, because I'm thinking my career's over. I, I didn't know what was going on. And I talked to my page supervisor and they said, you, what's going on? I said, oh, McLean made some really scary moves on me. And he goes, oh, he does that to all the girls. He, he followed Sandy Peterson down to the page lounge just the other week. And I'm thinking, Sand- I got jealous of Sandy Peterson all of a sudden. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, well, wait, he's, he's attracted to me, he's attracted to her. I said, no, he's just attracted to anything in a skirt. So, um, Writing this book, it helped me process mm-hmm. this. That wow. I realized I was doing my job. If if a guy had gone up to the office, if they said, um, Fritz, come up to the office, McLean wants to speak to you, it, I, you, would, you would go up the same way, like, okay, we need I to talk business. I would be flattered if he jumped me in his Oh, office. really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> No, well, it, sloppy tongue. It, it, <laughs> it is interesting the way you process it in the book because it's all of the emotions. It's what did I do wrong? It's what, why I was at work. What could I... The, how wrong is that to go into someone's office and then the immediate jealousy because we are, you know, we all as humans want to be attractive. We want to be special, but we want to have agency over who we're special with. And, you know, it's just so complicated. And you really did a wonderful job of processing. Yeah, you it. are a good writer. It's, oh, it's very thank you. great writer. Thank you. It's an yeah. excellent book. Wow. Thank you. I would like to go through some uh, definitions of terms with you right now, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. oh, Ooh, Always in the hallways. What does that mean? As you know, the way NBC was set up, and, and NBC, the way we knew it, no longer exists, sadly. No, no it doesn't. Um, we would run into people all the time in the hallways, especially when shows like Hollywood Squares were being done there, or Password, where there'd be some really great celebrities. I remember my the, the first like big star that I saw was this, it would appear to be like a little old lady, um, and she was carrying a garment bag, and I thought, well, I'm gonna help her carry this garment bag over to Hollywood Squares. And the hair was in curlers with the scarf, and uh, I didn't know that it was Janet Lee until I saw her name on the dressing room door. <laughs> um, there was a time when there was this woman walking down the hallway for a Bob Hope special, and all, all I saw were legs, 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 and it was Lucille Ball. Yeah. Um, That's a great story. I, I, I ran into, a, I, w- I was in my civilian clothes, and I saw Patty Duke in the hallway, and she was wearing the same blouse I was wearing. 
And she said, oh, look, we look at this. We could be sisters. And I said, or identical cousins. Ooh, you're <laughs> and fast. I thought, the minute I fast. said it, I thought, oh, am I being stupid? And no. then like, she laughed. She no, laughed. it was a point of recognition. Yeah. yeah. And then every once in a while, you get hit on in the hallways, too. So there was, well, that's there was not, a... that's that, not awful. That was... Here's some <laughs> other uh, definitions. CB. That stood for client booth. Uh, back in the olden days, when... Um, a particular company like a cigarette company or a floor wax company would sponsor a TV show like Craft Music Hall or something like that. They would have a special area that would just be designated for the advertisers. And they'd make it, you know, lots of food. There'd be people up there serving them. The pages would be serving them. And they could watch the show as it was being shot. The term is a bit arcane now, um, but it's a basically we as a page, if we were inside a signed working for a particular production company, we would be the CB in charge, would be men tending to the client booth. Uh, That happened with, um, there's this guy you might have heard of before, Ringo Starr. (laughs) Uh, Ringo was in the building once, and my friend Lisa was the CB on a special Ringo did that was kind of a a play on the old Prince and the Pauper story where where, where, uh, Ringo played Ignore Rats, which is his name spelled backwards. (laughs) And um, a woman kept calling, saying, let me talk to my ex-husband. I need to talk to him immediately. Put Ringo on the phone immediately. And Lisa's like, I can't do that. I can't do that. She was from the South. She's like, I can't do that. I can't do that. So finally, she says, I'm going to have your job if you don't put him on. So Lisa went into Ringo's dressing room, knocked on the door and said, your, your ex-wife is on the phone. She says, she'll have my job if I don't put you on the phone. And Ringo said, darling, she could never do your job. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, oh, and this is another one, not a funny story, but another time when, the, again, the pages had to be able to think on their feet. Mm-hmm. Um, my pal Jim McDonald was working a special that was a, a Johnny Cash special. And he gets this phone call, and it's from the governor of Utah. And they were getting ready to execute Gary Gilmore. And the governor said, Gary's last request is to speak to Johnny Cash. So as media people know, you don't just walk on the sound stage and say, oh, could you stop for a minute, please? But Jim ran in there and he's like waving his arms and said, stop, 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 stop. Went over to Johnny Cash, whispered in his ear, and Johnny put his guitar down and went out to the hallway and spoke to Gary Gilmore for about 45 minutes before he was executed. Went back into the studio, continued taping his special. And then at the time when Gary was being executed, Johnny asked for a moment of silence and everybody prayed. Wow. while that was going on. So we we encounter all kinds of stuff like that. How, how about one of your worst celebrity encounters? Well, we talked about McLean. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> as bad as it gets. Um, worst in, worst in counties, um, gosh, I wish I could say I had more. I did get to see Fred Astaire. I know that you mentioned Fred Astaire earlier. Oh, that see, was lovely. Yeah, see, that was... I. I read that and I was like, I should have been an NBC, you know, that moment yeah. of I'm reading your book and I'm like, I should have been an NBC page. But worst attitude other than McLean? Um, Condescending. Guys, uh, there's one of the pages that really didn't like Harvey Corman, didn't think he was a nice man. And and the reason he knew that a little bit is because he used to be, my Tom used to be um, a valet at Chasen's restaurant and Harvey wasn't nice there. And when he left his job at Chasen's, he's like, good, at least I won't have to deal with people like Harvey Corman anymore. And then there was Harvey Corman doing a show at NBC. In he comes, <laughs> in right. he comes. Um, How about your best encounter, a person whose memory will remain fond in your heart forever? James Stewart? Oh, yeah. Is, am I dropping a good name there? Yeah, you're dropping a good name yeah. and the Harry Chapin story. Oh, well, I'll get to Harry Chapin, absolutely. Um, Jimmy Stewart showed up in a limo. I was to take him over to the Tonight Show. It was it was around Christmas time, and his limo driver had a Polaroid camera. And the limo driver said, "Would you mind taking a picture with with Mr. Stewart and me?" And I was sure. And we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have cameras we with didn't us back have in the cameras. day. We were discouraged, as a matter of fact, yeah. from doing that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, as I'm getting ready to take Mr. Stewart into the Tonight Show. Uh, He says, why don't you take a picture of me with the little lady? (laughs) And I got that picture, which is in the book. And about five hours later, I was in the emergency room because um, all of a sudden my glands got really swollen. I had developed uh, hepatitis. 
oh, from working so hard, you know, between going to school and working the job and everything. It just caught up to me. Killed Jimmy Stewart. That's well, that's just it. Is I was I was going down the hallways <laughs> of the hospital saying, somebody get a hold of his people. I don't yeah. want to be the one that kills him. But Harry Chapin was just, I, I to this day, in my heart, I, I and I'm in touch with Tom Chapin, oh, Harry's brother. Oh, I love Tom. And um, I used to go to the Greek theater every summer to see Harry. I broke my leg. I was in a leg cast. Could go to the, I thought I couldn't go to the Greek. And uh, my friend George Glovna, page friend, we always have each other's backs, the pages. I've got to say that. We're, we're a tight George group of George Glovna became a stage manager of yes. the local news. I worked with him for many years. Yeah, and he went over to CBS for a while. Yeah. But George, I just saw him a couple weeks ago at a book signing. A lovely man. Uh, George says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. He got us front row seats to see Harry Chapin at the Greek. And I had my leg was in a cast. I had it propped up on, there was like a bar mm-hmm. in, fr- in, the, in the orchestra section and saw the concert. George got to sing All My Life's a Circle with Harry at the end of the show. So that Ooh, was wow. fabulous for him. So good things happen to good people. And the next day, Harry's on The Tonight Show. So I called George. I said, come on, we got to go say hi to Harry and tell him we saw the show last night. So I hobbled over there with my crutches. And before I could even say a word, Harry looked at me and went, you were at my show last night. (laughs) (laughs) And we got to talk a little bit. He is my hero. He is who I aspire to be someday. I knew nothing about him except the cats in the cradle. And I found out some really wonderful things about him during this documentary about Harry. First of all, that, that was a poem that his wife wrote. The Cats in the Cradle was, a, his mm-hmm. wife was a poet. Yeah. And she wrote that song. I didn't know that. Second of all, he devotes all of his life and much of his wealth to nonprofit organizations. He was just, he was like Mother Teresa. People just loved him because he gave to so many needy organizations. I just, well, and I, he, I, he was one of the people that helped inspire uh, the Hands Across America also. No, he was no, working no. with Ken Cragen. And um, he was always involved with hunger projects. That was yeah. his main focus. But... Um, his wife, it's so sweet because you're saying his. there's this, uh, a Harry Chapin song, I Want to Learn a Love Song. And uh, it's about how Harry went to teach this woman how to play the guitar. She wanted to hear her children sing. And that's how he fell in love with his wife, was teaching her how to play the oh, guitar. My. All right, before we move on, before we move on to Lawrence, uh, because Fritz will find this really interesting, the whole additional hidden layer behind the Joan Rivers-Johnny Carson feud may have started with a, a, a memo that is a lie. Did you know Jay Michaels? Yes, of course. Very oh, funny man. Very funny man. Very, if, I don't know if he gave you a vulgar nickname. He gave most uh, people. He took me out to lunch and he, uh, I laughed so hard. I cried <laughs> for the entire lunch. Very funny man. Yeah, a lot of us had very vulgar nicknames and it was a badge of honor. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the most politically incorrect person mm-hmm. that yeah, could possibly be an executive. Prison now if it were still yeah, <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I mean, he would do funny things too. Like um, there was a certain celebrity who'd gotten into some kind of trouble, and Jay um, commissioned a, a full-size chocolate toilet to be delivered to the person. He had a great sense of humor. He was. We ought to tell people he was like the creative services guy. He yeah. was in charge of talent, guest, rela- guest yeah, relations. Talent, rela- talent relations. He would send limos to the airport with people, mm-hmm. uh, and the pages would go with. Them, all the special events and he also helped get people out of trouble too that mm-hmm. was part of his job but um i spoke to um joan rivers former manager's good friend dorothy uh now living in israel and she told me the whole story where a memo was written that said these are the possible replacements for johnny carson and she said Letterman's name wasn't on the list, Leno's name, but it was like um, David Brenner's name, she remembered, was on the list. And then in J. Michael's handwriting, it said, you don't have a home here. And the letter was given to Edgar Rosenberg, Joan's husband. And now, she was the permanent guest host at that point, and she was on often. And, and, and her ratings were her. through the roof when she was on. It was an event when Joan was on. Because she was scathing and we want, you wanted to be there. You wanted to see what she was going to say. And at the same time, Joan had also been cautioned by Peter LaSalle that her humor was a little bit caustic for the general Tonight Show audience and that they wanted her to tone it down a little bit. She could have done that. But she was pulling in a certain audience. Oh, yeah. And this memo got to Joan. And rather than Joan calling Johnny saying, what the heck is going on here? She and Edgar went rogue made a deal with Barry Diller for Fox, got a late night talk show. And because there are no secrets in this town, Johnny knew about it. 
And Dorothy was there when Joan tried to call Johnny to tell him what she had done. And then Johnny picked up the phone and then just hung it up. Mm-hmm. Didn't talk to her. She tried to recruit Peter LaSalle to come with her. It was um, it was not a good time. And and she did this so wrong. Um, I, I just I, it didn't have to happen this way. Johnny held a grudge for a long time. too. Right, the way he his... treated uh, Fred de Cordova and keeping him out of the studio after that little kerfuffle with her son. But, anyway. what, with but Ricky, if that yeah. if that memo was fabricated by Jay, what was his motive? Was he he just didn't like Edgar? He, it was a it was a, a it was a bad joke gone worse. Yikes! And um, Jay would do a, like like the chocolate toilet. There was a he did a lot of very strange things. Conversely, after Edgar's death, um, he actually donated quite a bit of money to Guide Dogs for the Blind, which is where Joan asked money to be donated. And one of the stipulations was to name one of the dogs Edgar. Mm. So if there was this kind side to him. There was a side that no, you don't mess with Jay, Mm-mm. but he could be your best protector also. It was an interesting time. Well, your your book is very entertaining. You're a good writer. Thank you. And uh, for those of us that were there, it made me smile the whole way through. It's called My Peacock Tales, Secrets of an NBC Page. Shelley Herman, pleasure to have you, my darling. Thank you both so much. Thank you for being here. We're going to talk to Lawrence. All now. right, here we go. Yes. This talented man is known the world over as one of the preeminent finger-style acoustic guitar virtuosos. He's won two Grammy Awards. He spent three years as the lead guitarist for Paul McCartney and Wings. He's collaborated with many artists from Rosemary Clooney to Belinda Carlisle to Harry Styles. He just recorded, we think, his 36th album called A Day in My Life, featuring 12 of his personal arrangements of Beatles songs. It dropped the first week of February. This man, I'm very proud to say, was the band leader on my television show, It's Fritz, for two years. Lawrence, what the hell are you doing here? Frankly, Gov, you just don't play enough. This was a gig that got him no awards, did not make him wealthy, but we did get paid in unforgettable experiences. And I'm very happy to say he's been my friend. I I say it still, it was the best two-year period in my whole career. Lawrence Juber, everybody. So glad you're here, my friend. Thanks for having me. And your beautiful wife, Hope, who is talented. And oh my God, listen, before we start, I better do the family tree here. It's a famous showbiz family, Fritz. It's a a famous showbiz family. First of all, Hope is the daughter of Sherwood Swartz, who created Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch. And you guys, I think now you may have passed this responsibility off to your very talented musical daughters, produced musicals based on Gilligan's Island and the Brady's, and they were on the road for years and might still be. Are they still out there? There's a few productions of of Gilligan going. We're still in in negotiation with Brady. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Anyway, uh, what a talented family. Their two daughters, I can't remember their names, help me. Nico is the older daughter. Nico is the older one. And And Ilse. And talk about what they're doing in the music industry. Well, Ilse has been a very successful songwriter for the last decade. She wrote High Hopes for Panic at the Disco All Night on Beyonce's Lemonade album. Uh, Shawn Mendes, Mercy, Miley Cyrus, Nothing Breaks Like a Heart. Oh my goodness. She's got, yeah, yeah, her Spotify written by playlist is over 130 tunes. She's got the ear. Uh, But she has her own Mm. album out now on Electro Records um, called From the Valley. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Yeah. Be proud of your roots. That's yep. right. And she's going to keep you in a style to which you are accustomed. <laughs> that would be lovely. That'd be great. Um, and then Nico, our older daughter, wrote a musical called Millennials Are Killing Musicals, <laughs> which, which ran off Broadway uh, last spring. And she's hooked up with um, some very creditable people in New York and hopes to see that go further. Oh, and man. a few other projects that she's been involved in, too. But she quit her corporate job and said, I'm writing musicals now. So oh. the genes kicked in. You know? Oh, man. That's, what a family. I'm proud wonderful. of them for you. Um, I, and the first time I met Hope, even when you had just started with our show, and we'll talk about that later, uh, was with a cool band called The Housewives. I don't know how to describe them. They were like chiffons, but smarter, you know? We always yeah. called it domestic rock and roll. Domestic oh. rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, and sure. I mean, you, you, listen, one of your co- cohorts in that band was Maggie Mayall, the former wife of John Mayall, the, one of the great blues artists of all time. So, I mean, you guys, your tentacles go everywhere. That's right. 
<laughs> so, Lawrence, this is your uh, this is your new album. It is. It's twelve songs about the Beatles, recorded in Stage Two at Abbey Road. Abbey Road Studio Holy Two, cow. Yeah, which is where the Beatles recorded. Yes, and uh, the opportunity came up to record there because uh, we were going out to celebrate Billy J. Kramer's 80th birthday oh, in that goodness. studio, and I contacted Abbey Road and said, "Can I book a day?" which I did, and, and had the opportunity to record a dozen of my Beatle arrangements with the intention of doing a vinyl LP. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm sure your fans appreciate vinyl more than anybody does. Um, people appreciate vinyl. I mean, it's, yeah. it has its own following, and, and the experience of listening to music on vinyl is different. Yeah, from streaming or from now, CDs. Now, are you alone on this album? Because the picture of you in in Abbey Number Two is you're alone behind all this yeah. high. Oh yeah, equipment. I'm I'm alone. That's great. Yeah. Talk, <laughs> talk with hope in the control room. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I produce most of the, the solo yeah. albums, right? Yeah. Yeah. Talk for a moment about fingerstyle guitar because you in in your book uh, wings in your wings book, which is guitar, guitar with wings. With wings yeah. You talk about how when you first taught yourself how to read it clicked instantly like you it just locked into yeah. place like you knew it in a former life how to how to sight read so talk about how that evolved into even before you learned chords you were playing lead guitar well i i could play the melody of uh when the saints go marching in <laughs> basically <laughs> but but for me i i learned enough within the first couple of years that a local band leader started taking me out and putting me on the bandstand playing at weddings and, and those kind of functions. And, and I learned a lot about music from that circumstance. And I realized that, that I was a musician, not simply a guitar player, but, but I wanted to be able to express music through the guitar. Um, and that my ambition was to become a studio musician. Um, and over a course of my teenage years, I played in all, all kinds of bands, but I didn't want to leave school and turn professional because my parents had grown up in London during the Blitz, and my dad left school at 14, my mom at 15, and I felt it, that I owed it to them to get an education. Plus, music was something that you know was so engaging to me. And, and of course, I started November 63, which was really the breaking wave of Beatlemania in England, because we didn't have that Ed Sullivan moment. We had a whole year of the Beatles kind of just getting bigger mm, and bigger. And yeah. so eventually, I, I started some classical guitar. I was a big fan of of what we call the English folk Baroque, Pentangle, Bert Jansch, John Remborn, as well as the folk finger pickers, Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, that, that kind of soloistic approach to playing the guitar. And so there were these kind of parallel tracks that I was fascinated by solo guitar, but I wanted to make a living as a professional musician, and for me that meant being a studio musician. After I graduated from London University, I went straight into studio work, having played with the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. And I became a studio musician. And then in September of 1977, I was working on a TV show with David Essex, who was a big pop star at the time, hey, rock on. Hey, yeah. Love that. And Denny Lane was a guest on the show. And we oh. did Go Now. And Denny was in Wings. Yes. And, but Go Now was his hit from the Moody, the Blues, Moody Blues days. And I played the guitar solo on it, and he liked my playing. And about six months later, I got a call. I was actually working in Abbey Road in Studio 2 when I got a phone call. Of course, no cell phones. I had to go up the stairs and through the control room to get to the oh, phone. I had a receptionist in a white coat. When you see those documentaries, everybody's dressed like <laughs> yeah, they're in an up. emergency room at a hospital. It's the white <laughs> yeah, coats. And... Yeah, well, the engineers had to wear ties. I know. Is that to, I mean, you know. Did you do Wings recording? In oh, we record Wings oh, recorded man. there too. George yeah. In fact, we did it. We October of seventy eight. We did the Rockestra session there, where we had Wings, Led Zeppelin, The Who, Pink Floyd, old members of all those bands, all in the studio as a rock and roll orchestra. But but after I got this phone call to go audition, a couple of days later, I'm I'm in a basement studio in Soho Square, which is Paul's office. And you had talked about earlier about having to make the decision. Yeah. And, you know, I'd spent my teenage years working to become a, su a successful studio musician, which I had. And then Paul McCartney says, what are you doing for the next few years? So in a nanosecond, in a nanosecond. I had to make that choice. And, then and there was no forward. way I was going to turn down Paul McCartney. And when yeah. you look back at that crossroad and the path you took, 
and how e- everything led to the next thing. It could even take you to your wife and your kids. Like it's well, it did. It's monumental. Because, you know, because what happened was wings. You know, I was had that experience. I, I'd like to refer to it as getting my master's degree from McCartney University because <laughs> it was just a great education. You know, and it also taught me what it meant to be an artist. And a lot of stuff about how the music business really works and where the money is in music, mm. which is a music publisher. Did you write with him at all for that album? No. Mm. No. He, he really, I mean, he was still at that point still very much writing on his own. He and Danny wrote a little bit. But, you know, even the whole period that Danny was in the band, there's only a couple of songs that they wrote together. Of course, one of them was Mal of Kintyre, which Ooh. is one of the biggest selling singles of all time in Europe. But that's and another the best story. wing song, too, I think. Um, but what happened was when Wings was, was folding in early 81, I moved to New York. And I was spending a lot of time hanging out at Catch a Rising Star, which is a great comedy club. And I would watch the comedians. And I loved the fact that there was a kind of something analogous about comedian, stand-up comedians having that self-sufficiency and being able to engage an audience. And that went along with what I was looking at in terms of what one could do as a solo guitar player. See, I can't even talk about guitar without doing that. <laughs> what one could do as a soloistic guitar player to engage an audience. So there was a very learning experience there. What I didn't know and this came about through your your show, in fact, was that when we had Sam Kinison as a guest on the show, everybody was kind of worried about his wild man mm-hmm. you know, potential act- antics. He came straight over to me at the rehearsal, put it, gave me a bear hug, and it turned out that he used to sit in the audience at Catch a Rising Star and watch me when I played there, and I inspired him to play guitar. Oh, oh my. which wow. is really yeah, that was. I'll tell you, uh, his persona was completely different than the really gentle, lovely human being <laughs> he was. But when he did our show, he was well into his cocaine habit, and I remember him having not bathed in about three days before he got there. I don't know if you remember that from your hug. You probably still have that <laughs> essence on your coat. But but he just was. But he was so lovely, and he brought me something I value very much. It's going in the Fritz Coleman Museum, which will be adjunct to the Smithsonian. Uh, he brought me a rundown because at the Comedy Store, Mitzi Shore used to hand write the run- rundown uh-huh. of yeah, from the from the original room and he brought me this one that had uh howie mandel um uh, uh sam kinnison um uh, i don't know who else was on there a bunch of people and fritz coleman <laughs> and they were working their way to the lowest point in the uh, tax bracket all the way down i got there but it, it was one of the things that i value the most most he was just people really never understood what a lovely person he was he was just crazy and he developed his act because he was an evangelical minister and all those chops and screaming and yelling on stage were how he preached the bible when he was younger anyway that was just a good memory. so it was at Catch a Rising Star that I met Hope. Whoa. Oh, my God. And Hope, what were you doing in New yeah. York at the time? <laughs> okay, now you get my side of it. <laughs> yes. I saw this gentleman. <laughs> well, actually, it started a long... How we met started a long, long time ago because um, it started when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. And I was, from that magic moment on, Beatle fan. And I just... I was not the screaming on the other side of the fence kind of Beatle fan, but they were always my favorite band, and I always just adored their music. And my my college thesis was in a play that I wrote entirely of Beatle lyrics. And yeah. and uh, when I graduated from from college, I went immediately into writing, even though I got my degrees in in directing and acting. But I went right into writing. And I was trying to sell scripts, and I was going to meetings and pitching shows and things like that. And it was right around that time that John was killed. And I just stopped. I just, I went into a massive depression and I wasn't coming out of it. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I wasn't eating. was the same way. Really? She had just come out here like a week before from Buffalo, New York, where we were living. Mm -hmm. And it happened and it really, really affected her. It wrecked me. Not affected me, me, but unbelievable. Yeah, Yeah. it wrecked me. And and my parents were getting very worried about me. And my my dad was calling up and and he wanted to send me to a therapist. And my, my mother called up one day and she said, I know what's going to make you feel better. Why don't you go get your hair done? And I, I'm like, 
okay, I'm having like this existential crisis and my mother wants me to get my hair done. But she was mom and I didn't want to make her feel bad or anything. So I, I said, hair, fine, make an appointment, I'll get my hair done. So she made an appointment uh, at her hairdresser at Beverly Hills and I went to see him and he's doing my hair and he said, what's going on with you? You seem so sad. And I said, I've just been very depressed ever since John Lennon was killed. And he said, you know, I have one more client. Why don't you go down the stairs, walk around the block. When you're done, I'll be done. Let's go have a cup of coffee. And I said, okay, fine. So I go downstairs and I'm starting to walk around the block. And I wasn't looking where I was going. I just had my, my head down and my eyes down. And I walked straight into somebody. And I'm like, bam. And I'm standing on a pair of boots. And I look up and I'm standing on Ringo Starr. And in the middle, on top of him, on his on his feet. I mean, I'm literally standing on his boots. So he hadn't fallen over yet. No. Okay. No. He was standing there with with Barbara, his at that point fiance, but the one who called for Shelley. Yeah. Barbara Bach. No. Oh, the oh, and a a wife that Barbara Bach was his latest one. He's still married. Okay. Yes, he's still married. Got it. Yeah. So he was there with Barbara, and and I I apologized and I said I'm I'm just so sorry about stepping on you and I'm just so sorry about John and I turned to leave and he said hold on a minute can I talk to you for a minute now I did not know him I I'd never met him and so I said sure and he started telling me about his relationship with John Lennon wow and I was just blown away I mean he was telling me about the only thing that was bringing him through this particular time was work and he was just finishing up an album, uh, and it's become a real focus for him. And if you can really focus on work, it can really bring you through times. I guess it was just all over my face. I don't know. But he just... But how open of him. I yes. Mean, wow. It, it just notice. feels to me, though, I don't know if you feel the same way or you think the same way I do, but it feels like John orchestrated that collision. Well, it Yeah, gets, that was divine intervention. I, yeah. I agree with that. It Go gets ahead. crazier. Okay. So <laughs> so wow. I'm you know, I'm standing there with Ringo and he's telling me all all about his relationship with, with John and this new album and and so I after I thanked him and and I went home and I was thinking about it a lot and my my dad called up a couple of weeks later, my dad calls up and he, he said, I have a new show coming on at NBC and uh, I, we're going to be filming over at Paramount. I'd like you to become an, a writer on it. And I had always said no to dad. I had changed my name. I had like, I didn't want to work with my family. So your dad's a well-known person. Yes. Yes. Go ahead and tell folks who he is. Oh, okay. No, I did earlier. Oh, you did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So he, it was uh, the Brady Brides. It was an offshoot of the Brady, Brady Brides. Right. And they had a fake Jan or a fake Marsha. I forget. I lose no. track of my fake <laughs> Brady's. No. No, that was a one. Christmas movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they were both in it. Yeah, they were Go both ahead. in it. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so he said, would you come and be a writer on the show? And I was going to say no, but then I just, I started thinking about this encounter with Ringo. And I thought, an opportunity to work. Maybe that's what I need to do. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So I started working at NBC. Well, not at NBC, but we were filming at Paramount. But mm-hmm. um, and our soundstage was right next to the Mork and Mindy soundstage. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and I ended up in a dating relationship with Robin Williams. And so he was going to New York to film World According to Garp, and he wanted me to come to New York with him. And I, I, I said I couldn't because we were right in the middle of filming. And so he said, well, if you go on hiatus, call my house. There'll be somebody house-sitting and tell them that you're coming and they'll give you information and, and they'll tell me when you're going to be here. I said, fine. So we went on hiatus. I call his house and this woman answers the phone and her name is Charlie and she has this very thick English accent. And she said, oh, yeah, Robin said, be calling. Here's where you're staying. I'll let him know you're coming. Fine. So I go to New York, and I'm with with Robin, and he's doing an interview one night, uh, and he said, I'm going to send you to this club to wait for me. Said, Fine. So go to this club, catch a rising star. So I walk in, and I hear that a couple of people talking, and they're saying, oh, Paul McCartney's guitarist is there. And I thought, well, that's that's cool. I didn't know the members of Wings, but I thought, yeah, that's interesting. So I'm talking to this woman, and she's a singer, and she said, oh, I'm working with some musicians, and here they come. Do you want to meet them? I said, sure. So these three guys walk over to me, 
and this guy's in the middle. What a great story. And <laughs> we met, and it's one of those movie moments where everything gets all faded away, and it's just us, and I forget all about Robin. I forget all about why I'm in New York in the first place. Did you pay Robin back for the trip? Because that's, <laughs> that's sad. No. So I, um, I ended up going out to dinner with Lawrence, and we go back to his apartment, and there's this big poster, and it's a Wings poster. And I said, wait, that looks like you. And he said, yeah, I was in that band. And so we're talking, and he's telling me about this album that he just finished working on with Ringo. So, no. Yeah. Oh you are yes. not serious. Yes, and then we're talking some more, and we're telling about old boyfriends, old girlfriends, and he, he said that he has this one uh, girlfriend that, that he had that was uh, doing an album in L.A., and she's staying at um, Eric Idle's house, and her name is Charlie. And I wow. said, she's, she's not at Eric Idle's house. She's at Robin's house. I talked to her right before I got on the plane. So I was on the phone with his old girlfriend right before I... <laughs> okay, how did this get sorted? This, what do you mean? You had to get well, married. It was part, well, it, well, he said how he was, did you were with Robin. Yes. And now you're with Lawrence. Yes. So how did you process what was happening and what needed to happen moving forward well he started t talking about marriage the night we met he did yes yes he said that he well you could talk so well, <laughs> you know i mean it, I, it was love at first story. sight from yeah, my was, point yeah. of view oh. so yeah yeah and, it was love at first and here we are you know 43 years late <laughs> but did you when did you have a conversation with robin that you needed to break things off with him i didn't this Robin was, Williams. This was you 1981. You, know? oh. <laughs> you ghosted Robin Williams. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But and what, another thing that was pretty crazy was when, when my dad was a writer in L.A. and he went back to New York to stay for a week and uh, he met my mother. And he fell instantly in love with her and decided to stay another week in New York. So when I met Lawrence... Uh, now, my parents had no idea why I was in New York. I was just in New York, as far as they knew. So um, I decided that I was going to stay another week in New York, and I called my parents to, to talk to them about it. And I called, and my mom answered the phone, and I said, I'm going to stay another week in New York. And she yells, to, and I hear this on the phone, she yells to my dad, she's going to stay another week in New York. I hear my dad yell back, she's going to marry him. And my mom said, what him? She didn't say anything about a him. And my dad says, if she's staying another week in New York, she's met a him, and she's going to marry him. You just watch. Wow. So your dad knew This was your dad like a you. puzzle that the universe put together for him. And it went from, <clears throat> from John Lennon's death to Ringo oh, to Paul. That's really a beautiful story. Is that crazy? There might be a play in that. Get your daughter to work on that. <laughs> wow. But of course, yeah. there is one Beatle missing, right? George. Yeah. So we got to have a George story, yeah. right? So what happened there? Okay. Was, mm -hmm. I was asked to play with George in the studio when he was recording some of the music for the Shanghai Surprise movie. And this was in April of 86. Hope was very excited at the prospect of meeting George. But also very pregnant. But she was also nine <laughs> oh. months pregnant. Goes into labor the night before. Oh, yeah. Lord. So, and I'm like, so, no, I, I can't have the baby. I'm, I'm going to the studio <laughs> to, meet, to George. meet George Harris. So instead, instead of instead, here comes the son, it was here, here comes, comes the daughter. daughter right? Oh, <laughs> my God. And Ilse is born at seven in the morning. I'm in the studio with George at noon because there's no way Hope was not, was not going to let me go Work, work with, with George. George. No, of course not. Yeah. I got him on the phone with her. Said, when you're ready, come visit. So Ilse is two days old. First place she ever went. Village Recorders in West LA. And George came and took her out of the, the baby carrier and went into the studio and began dancing with her and waltzing. Like, just, it was magical. Oh. And he's talking in, like, Sanskrit, and he's w dancing around with her. Was this in L.A. or in London? LA. This is in L.A. Oh. Yeah. oh, my goodness. And we just stood back and watched. It was, it was incredible. It just, just was this moment. And then he, he came over, and he said something in, I guess, Sanskrit, and he touched her here, and he handed her to me, and I said, what did you say to her? And he said, well, I was just, I was dancing with this new life and feeling her energy. And at the end, I decided that I would really like to give her the gift of music. And so I did. And Blessed that's our, by a Beatle. That's our uh, Grammy-nominated songwriter. <laughs> wow. yeah. 
So we'll you're see. not going to take any of the credit for this kid. You're willing to give it all to no, George Harrison. She was just Harrison. following the universe's instructions. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Man, that was crazy. <laughs> really unbelievable. What, so a, what a beautiful, beautiful story. I didn't, and I've known you for 35 years, and I think the first I ever heard that. Wow. Yeah. I think every human you walk by in the street contains a multitude of stories. Yes. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the Fritz show because I have to for my well, own Well, that's you know, the, a good idea. When, yeah. when you did the special yeah. before you did the series, mm -hmm. I mean, that was how we met was actually through the, the Housewives, Housewives because yeah. they, they were guests on that show. They were some of our favorite guests. They were very entertaining. Yeah. You didn't just step on his feet on the sidewalk? No, <laughs> no. Okay. But, but, but the, the, w w there were so many beautiful pieces of luck that happened. You know, Lawrence is in town, and all the guys you hired to be in our band were essentially players that were with other bands or session players that were just in town. And they weren't all there every week, but we benefited from this action. Talk about some of the people that played in our group. Well, the core band was myself and then Bruce, the late Bruce Gary on drums from The Knack and the late Phil Chen, who was Rod Stewart's bass player, Do You Think I'm Sexy?, also, I'd known Phil from the mid-70s when we used to do recording sessions in London because he was one of the great reggae bass players. Also mm -hmm. played on Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow album, which is one of the finest guitar instrumental albums mm -hmm. of all time. And then each week we would have a different guest. So we had like Booker T, we had Edgar Winter, we had, um, we mentioned Sam Kinison came mm -hmm. on, um, and T -Bear, Richard T. Bear, who was one of the people standing next to me when Hope and I met. Those three guys walking, one of them was T-Bear, who Lawrence wow. is still working with today. Yeah, in fact, wow. I just co-produced his album. And you had J-Bo yeah. and some of those guys. Uh, Freebo? Uh, Freebo. Freebo, Freebo I mean, yeah. yeah Freebo. Freebo was, what an interesting character he was. And yeah. he used to call me periodically afterward just to see how I was doing. And I thought that was very nice. He's a sweet man. Yeah, his, but we, and you know, the other just musical about... acts we had, we had the Commodores on there. We had, and I'll walk 500 miles. Oh, yeah, the Proclaimers. Yeah, the yeah, Proclaimers. And I remember um, also Peter Noon. Peter, Peter Noon. Whoa. And we had him on this podcast. Yeah. We love he Peter is a Noon. very entertaining He's human very being. funny. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, but, but we, we sort of backed into the musical success of that show in two ways. First of all, having you and, and, and bringing all these wonderful players in. But also we learned from the record industry in town, Warner Brothers and Universal, that these, these companies that were representing young bands that had no television exposure, they wanted to give them a chance to perform on a TV show as a piece of tape to show around and get them around. And we were great. So that you had Mary's Danish, Drama Rama, all mm -hmm. these sort of alt bands, Concrete Blonde, remember that? The woman oh, yeah. was not blonde. But, but oh you my. know, Chris Carter... Who has breakfast? Yeah, oh yeah, with we had him on here. Yeah, but he was on. Dr he was in Drama. Drama Rama. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and so these record companies saw this as a chance to give them TV mm -hmm. experience and a and a good piece of tape. It was a well produced show. Oh yeah. And so we didn't have to do any work. That we got calls. Get Barry got calls all the time to please book our band on here. They have a new album out, and that was. It was just a confluence of great things. But all the comedians. That you oh, had my goodness, too. yeah. And that was another smart move we made. We made all the, these comics uh, write their own sketches. And so they would take a piece of their material that already worked and they would flesh it out so it could have multiple characters. And we gave Adam Sandler his first TV show. David Spade was on there. Jim Carrey was on there. I mean, it was, it was the best two years of my career, without question. I think I was in one of the sketches. Oh, I'm sure you, you were. I remember you were playing lute. <laughs> yeah, the sketches. And Max Alexander was my sort of my co-host, and he did the weather as a Scottish guy, and he he dressed up with, like in kilts and everything, and did the weather. <laughs> there was a lot of crazy stuff, and it's starting to show up on YouTube. Whoever, oh, I know whoever has uh, really? is it? VHSs of it starts to load it. I put it's Fritz, and there's a celebrity surgery is a oh, sketch yeah. and it was where a contestant gets to have a celebrity perform surgery on him and Lawrence is in it so I you know. oh that was just a bit yeah. what, what really funny was you know Adam Sandler last year got the uh, Kennedy Center honors and so the producer of that show called me and said you know Adam Sandler talks about your show being the first TV performance do you have any video of that and I called Barry and I called Bob and all these people and nobody had a copy of the tape that had Adam on our show it's people that, that had a VHS 
and recorded it at home. Those are the people that have copies yeah. of it. Well, I know that Bruce Gary had a complete collection of it. Yes. Oh, really? But I don't know what ever happened to him. No. No. Yeah. no. Yeah. That was All right. Sad. So if you know anyone who knows anyone who has, it's, <laughs> it's Fritz. Too late now. Fritz would love copies of, of, of the show. But it sounds Those like you- great times. And, you know, if I was a smarter businessman and had a little more juice at NBC, we could have taken that show anywhere because a couple of things happened. That was the time when David Letterman, when it was still following Carson, they were doing uh, a syndication over on A&E. Remember, they were rerunning those? And they called Barry and said, uh, you know, we're interested maybe in running the Fritz show after the, after the Letterman reruns, or, or, but we didn't have enough episodes because we only did like 26 episodes finally. So we didn't, you have to have 60, 50 or 60 episodes, but we, we missed that. And then Byron Allen came in and blew us out of our gig because he came in. He was producing at the time, uh, Evening at the Apollo or something, and he would do this business model where he came to our boss and said, if you will air this show, I will give it to you for free as long as within the body of the show you air two 30-second Ford commercials. And my boss said, your show cost me thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a week with all the players and everything. I can't pass this thing up. And he felt bad about it. And I said, I understand. But if I was a better business guy, I could have negotiated. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in your book, before we, we close, Lawrence, in your book, you uh, Music with Wings. Guitar you, with Wings. Oh, Guitar with Wings. Yeah. In my notes, it says Music with... Well, no, are I you willing to change the, the book, right title <laughs> so that it matches my notes? Are you willing? <laughs> okay. Well, we could reprint it. No. <laughs> I think it's better this way. Guitar with Wings, you write that psychologists claim that the music we listen to in our 15th year creates the strongest impression on our developing teenage brain. And for you, that was Cream, Hendrix, The Beatles, Pink Floyd, The Doors. And you call it the dawn of album rock when genres crossed and the dominant paradigm was routinely some subverted. Talk about that at a little greater length, if you would, because I think we were all, you know, we listened to that quote and we think about what we were listening to at 15. And it's still the stuff that we turn up in the car, you right. know, when, when it comes back on. Well, it was Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you experienced? Mm -hmm. uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which was the first Pink Floyd album. Yeah. And just so much. 1967 was just such a fruitful year. But it was everything you wanted to be. It was all these genres mm -hmm. in, in this collective and... But it's interesting because you know, there's this notion, in fact, uh, the um, journalist, author Elijah Wald has a book about how the Beatles killed rock and roll hmm. because rock and roll was dance music. Okay. But by 1967, it had become art music. So from Chuck and, Berry uh, to Yeah, Pink and Floyd. it really, and the fact that I was studying music and, and was just deeply into any any of the genres. I mean, I wasn't specifically listening to rock and roll. It could be classical, it could be renaissance, which is what led me into studying music at university. Uh, but the fact that, that rock had become an art form at that point, mm -hmm. that yeah. it was, was, had graduated to the point where, I mean, when the, what the Beatles were doing even in 1966 with the Revolver album with backwards tape loops and mm -hmm. all kinds of this kind of stuff where Paul's going to Stockhausen concerts. You know, it's, it's not just Buddy Holly anymore it's, yeah. or Elvis. It's, and I don't think that could exist now. I mean, all the great experimental music that was done in the 60s and the 70s, you know, Cream and, uh, and all those great, also the very melodic stuff, like you talked about Jerry and the Pacemakers being one of the first concerts you ever went to. I just love them so much. And, uh, but, but, but all the experimental stuff and, and alternate, alternative FM radio mm -hmm. where you could play a 12-minute cut and not care, they don't do that anymore. I mean, there's no place for that sort of creativity to have a venue. Well, I think there is, but it's not necessarily in the broadcast media. Right. I mean, even then, I mean, I, I first heard Sgt. Pepper on Radio Caroline, which was a pirate radio station broadcasting on a boat in the English Channel. You know, the BBC banned A Day in the Life because they thought it was about drugs. Really? Even though, I mean, you know, found my way upstairs, you know, um, the, the, the bit and had a smoke. That's where you could smoke on a bus in oh. England was upstairs. You couldn't smoke downstairs. Tell um, us a Paul McCartney story because you came to know your idol as a friend. How was he as a boss? <laughs> he was a good boss. Well, and it wasn't just him. It was Paul and Linda. I mean, they were oh, very right. much the ultimate creative couple. And, and it was a great example for, for Hope and myself working together is the fact that they, they were a creative couple. They were rarely apart. 
you know, except for when Paul was in jail for nine days in Japan, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> and they were raising a family and being creative. Now, of course, it helps to have, you know, the kind of bank account that Paul has, but, but the, the basic principle was very inspiring. And, and it, you know, so that when Hope, when we first got together and Hope said, hey, I have this idea about this comedy rock and roll band, is yeah, I can work with you on that. You know, I can do that and also do whatever else I'm doing, become a studio musician. Did Linda produce any of their Wings stuff or the later Beatles stuff? Or? She didn't produce, yeah. but, but she was very much a part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and she did have, I mean, her musical sensibility was very evolved. Be, way before she ever was taking photographs of the Stones and, you know, mm -hmm. all the, the rock musicians. I mean, she grew up in a household where music was very important because her dad, Lee Eastman, was the number one music attorney in New York. Mm -hmm. He represented Tommy Dorsey, Frank Lasser. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, and so he was the one who kind of guided Paul into, look, you know, buying music publishing catalogs is a great investment. And Paul had always, you know, and he talked to us about the fact that when the Beatles became successful, that the, the management and the financial people were saying, oh, you should buy this brush factory. This would be a good investment. And Paul said, no, I, you know, I want to invest in music. And, you know, he's now, I think, the largest independent music publisher and in the world. a lot of big artists, even Dylan, are they're selling their catalogs now. And Springsteen sold his catalog mm -hmm. for ungodly amounts of money yeah Crazy. well we're gonna have you perform yeah let me grab oh my guitar my Hang on. are you gonna perform something from your new album I lauren forgot he's a guitarist <laughs> yes he does play <laughs> the guitar yeah and tell us a little about you, this this selection and the the album and where we can find it well the album is called a day in my life i could i, I have both a day in the life and in my life on the record mm -hmm. And I couldn't decide which one to call it. And then I thought, well, I'll put the two oh, together. That's a combination. Walking the dogs, and I got inspired. Yeah. <laughs> Do we need to move the microphone at all, Jordan yeah, I'll move it. and Garrett? Right, as, soon as, as soon as I'm done talking, oh, I'll it, move it down. It. Um, He's a professional. And the, <laughs> the, um, the, it was all recorded in one day in Abbey Road. Wow. Like from 11 till 6, basically, with a break for lunch. <laughs> You know, I, we, and we've done this before. I did an album called Downtown, which we did in five hours at Capitol Studios with Al Schmidt Engineering, who was wow. 88 years old, the godfather of engineers. Um, I like that kind of intensity. And having been a studio musician for my whole career, um, I'm very comfortable in studios. I don't need two or three days to get used to being there. I mean, it's just sit down and get the job done. Um, and these were all arrangements. These were not new arrangements. I'd recorded these before, and I'd had the benefit, in some cases, of playing them for a couple of decades. So the idea of being able to record them with a fresh perspective and also in the same room that the records were originally recorded by the Beatles um, was oh, an opportunity that just allowed, I think, you know, to absorb that energy... I was going to say, are there ghosts in the machine in that place? Holy well, smokes. The, the, I think even before the Beatles, I mean, that studio has been around since 1931. And I think that there's something, I think it must be an intersection of ley lines or something because there is some energy about that room that is just, it's not like a normal recording studio. It's almost like walking into a portal yeah. in some extra dimension. I, I understand that. Yeah. And Lawrence has actually four Beatles arrangement albums out oh, yes lj plays the beatles lj plays the beatles volume two lj can't stop playing the beatles <laughs> <laughs> and the fab fourth so wow. <laughs> all right so i think a little bit of blackbird here
Wow, you guys. You know, I just remembered, we had Kenny Rankin. Yes, we did. And, and I, I think I did him Blackbird him. with him. Yes. Oh. Yeah. What a beautiful soul he was. Oh, I yeah. opened for him at a place called At My Place. Over at My Place. place. Yeah. We used to play that. Okay, that was a yeah. great, it was a great gig for a comic because you were the only comic and you got to do five or ten minutes between acts. I opened for uh, lots of guys, uh, Billy and the Beaters. I mean, mm-hmm. all these great bands. Yeah, yeah, the Housewives used to play, play there once a month. Yeah. I, I don't think I knew that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great play. Yeah, it's a I butcher can't tell you how What is it now? It's a butcher shop. It's a butcher shop. No, I know. It's a coach. The Horn, Butcher. which was right across the street, which is one of the clubs I started in, is now a honey baked ham. Yeah. See, that's immoral, isn't it? <laughs> well, you can it's shop like Madame for Wong's is a pet co, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a pet co. I, I mean, it means so much for me to have you guys on. You've been my friends for many years, and I, I have it unlocks a lot of memories I'll be thinking about for the rest of the day. Thanks for coming. And I well, hope this is a, having I hope this is a huge success for you, Lawrence. This was a beautifully Thank rich you. episode. Thank you so great. much. Thank Here you come so much. your closing credits. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter. We are at Media Path Pod and on Facebook where our show page is Media Path Podcast. And our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Weezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. And we would love it if you would visit us on YouTube so that you can judge our appearance and then subscribe. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to know all about what media you've been consuming and enjoying. If you enjoy this show, please give us a nice rating wherever you get your podcast and share our social media posts so that your friends can learn about your excellent taste in podcasts. Our website is mediapathpodcast.com. It is a great place to browse around and find interesting episodes you may have missed. We also have a fun and sassy newsletter loaded with photos and quizzes and more dish about our guests. All the newsletters are right there for you to enjoy on our website. You can sign up to get your newsletter sent directly into your inbox. Just one per week. We understand healthy boundaries. We want to thank... (laughs) We want to thank our guests, Shelly Herman and Lawrence Juber and Hope Juber. Our team includes producer Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Bill Filipiak, Mason Brown, Garrett Arch, Jordan Reyes, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman. Be well and wise, and we will see you along the media path. This might be our longest show. So we're going to take some photos.